Hello, everybody. My name is Chris Yandorf, and I welcome you to the HRB International Tax Webinar. Our topic today are the mandatory disclosure rules within the EU. We have a renowned panel today, presenters from uh, Germany, the United, uh, United Kingdom, and Italy. I would like to introduce the speakers to you. I start with Professor Till Sek. He is Professor for Tax Law at Brunswick European Law School, and he is of counsel partner at Schumacher and Partners in Münster. Till is today together with his students. He is actually sitting in a classroom where his international tax students are listening to the session. And uh, so uh, this is a good opportunity for us to bring this knowledge to a broad uh, audience. With us today is also Nick Farmer. He is a, a renowned international tax advisor in the UK. He is based in London and is partner at Mensis Limited. And he has tax experience for uh, more than 20 years in international debt taxation. And he will give his comments on the EU perspective as well uh, on the UK perspective. Then we have Emmanuel Passera from Italy. He is Chartered Accountant at Milan and partner at Studio Perotta. He is uh, very experienced in international tax structuring, especially international corporate law and tax consultancy. I myself, I'm Chris Yandorf. I am professor at University in Münster and partner uh, at Schumacher and Partners in Münster. And uh, I have experience in international tax law for more than 15 years now. So let's start with the topics. Today I would like to give you, I would like to start with a short overview on what we are uh, doing today. Uh, first point is a short introduction on what uh, um, um, the topic mandatory disclosure is all about. Then we take a look at persons who are subject to these uh, regulations. And then what has to be reported, what is the notification period and which information has to be transmitted. I would like to ask Till to explain us the core idea uh, and what all this is based on, because um, the rules are not falling from the heaven. They have a, a, a certain intention and they're sort of, let's say, part of the disruptive change in international tax law as such. So please still, could you give us an idea? Yeah, thank you, Christian. Um, hello to everybody in the audience. Um, as everything in international tax law nowadays, the whole story began with that international program between 2013 and 2015 of the OECD. And in action point 12 of the 15 action points, it was a, a topic disclosure of aggressive tax planning. So the idea of the OECD has been to develop a tool that um, the tax administrations were able to get all relevant information from their point of view, what they need to, to, to see what tax planners do worldwide. And uh, these, uh, this OECD discussion led to the draft of the, um, the 31st of May, in, uh, March in 2015. And this was the first draft about mandatory disclosure rules. And in the following years, it was discussed worldwide in Europe, how should we deal with this OECD discussion draft? And the European Union decided to set up a directive. And this directive has then a mandatory duty to all member states of the European Union to 
put this in their national law. And um, as you can see, the, the directive comes from 25th of May in 2018, and uh, it came into force on the 25th of June in 2018. And it sets up the minimum requirements for a national reporting obligation for cross border planning. In the final um, um, setup of the EU directive, there is no um, expression of aggressive tax planning anymore. It is just enough if you have a cross border design. And what makes it so important for us is the retroactive effect. Uh, in Germany, the whole the whole law, the whole national law, will come into effort uh, in, into effect in uh, July 2020, on the 1st of July of 2020. But you have then to disclose all tax planning you did beginning on the 21st of June 2018 until then. That means we are already in the time slot of, or in which you have to, to collect all tax planning recommendations you do to your clients because next year you have to um, report them then in Germany to the German tax authority, or in the UK to the UK tax authority. So the timeline is already running. Okay, still. thank you very much. We'll be talking about the timeline a little bit later in more detail. And uh, as to mention, the UK already have implemented uh, such rule on their uh, own uh, local uh, tax law, independent from the development uh, in the European Union. And uh, Nick will uh, give us uh, his comments later when we come to the crucial points. Um, Emmanuel, yeah. is, could you give us a, 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 a short, uh, with, with a few words, what is the uh, core issue of DAX6? Yes, thank you, Christian. DAX6 uh, is the Directive on Administrative Cooperation. Um, and uh, the main fulfillment uh, coming from this law are represented by the uh, so-called uh, reportable cross-border arrangement, which means that uh, in the future we will be the mandatory to report uh, to the local tax authorities uh, all the informations uh, regarding uh, tax aggressive uh, uh, cross-border arrangements. The second uh, fulfillment uh, from this law is represented by the automatic uh, information exchange uh, between uh, uh, the European tax uh, authorities. So from these two um, uh, main points of this law, we can understand that uh, uh, the purpose uh, of taxes uh, the six uh, is to create uh, um, a database uh, with all the information uh, information regarding uh, um, a tax aggressive uh, cross border um, arrangements thank you emmanuel what is the timeline in italy Yes, this is uh, the, um, the timeline uh, from the Italian point of view, but uh, the main uh, deadlines are similar, similar in the other European countries. So uh, we, uh, we can see that uh, DAXIS, the adoption of DAXIS uh, will start uh, uh, with, uh, as we will see in the next slides, with a retroactive effect uh, from uh, um, 2018 and in Italy in uh, July at the end of July of last year a draft of Italian legislative decree um, transposing taxes uh, uh, <coughs> has been uh, uh, published for the uh, consultation uh, of interested uh, parties 
uh, at the end of uh, September of uh, the last year, um, the, cons the public consultation uh, ended of this draft decree, and uh, at the end of uh, during the November of the last year, uh, one of the chamber of the Italian par Parliament, in particular the Chamber of Deputies, approved uh, the draft law. Uh, transposing uh, taxes into Italian law. So after this approval, we are waiting for the approval uh, by uh, the other chamber of the Italian parliament, which is uh, the Senate. Uh, this approval uh, has, um, has to be, very, very, there must be this approval uh, within the deadline uh, of the end uh, of 2019, which is the uh, last uh, deadline. During this year, there was a meeting between uh, the Italian Ministry of Economy with the parties in order to um, to, um, uh, to take uh, attention, attention on the uh, proposal coming from the parties. When uh, the uh, decree will be approved uh, definitely uh, the next year, uh, there will be the first application of uh, DAXIS uh, regime, regime um, an application with a retroactive effect. effect. And uh, um, so in October of 2020, there will be the, the first uh, um, informa information exchange among uh, uh, the European tax uh, authorities. Uh, and then we can see that uh, um, the 1st of July 2022, it's planned uh, the, the first revision on the hallmark, uh, hallmarks, uh, which are the criteria uh, to, to use uh, in order to identify the tax aggressive uh, cross-border arrangements. So I was put on mute by the organizer. So that's the reason why I uh, uh, okay. just come back now. Um, sorry, Manuel. Uh, you are still in the draft state at the moment. Maybe you could also give us a short overview about uh, the content because this will uh, 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 would be a good transfer to uh, the next points when we discuss these points in detail. Uh, yes, uh, uh, this is, uh, mm, so we understood that uh, the purpose of this uh, uh, European directive is uh, to take uh, uh, um, a lot of uh, information uh, regarding uh, the tax aggressive uh, uh, cross-border arrangements and uh, in this slide we can see a list uh, of uh, this information uh, such as uh, the identification of all uh, uh, the taxpayers and the intermediaries involved in these operations uh, the details of the relevant, relevant applicable hallmarks uh, um, the summary of and the value of this operation, uh, the date in which uh, uh, the first step of, uh, in, implement, in implementation was made, um, and the details of the relevant local law, and uh, at the end the identification of the relevant uh, taxpayers uh, and any other persons uh, involved in this arrangement. So. Uh, we can um, we can understand that uh, um, with uh, this uh, all this information, uh, um, the European tax authorities uh, uh, will have uh, the um, the instruments uh, um, uh, in order to uh, identify um, in an easier way uh, the so-called uh, tax aggressive. Uh, uh, cross-border arrangements. Thank you, Emmanuel. I would like now to go a little bit more into the details. And I think a crucial point is um, uh, to talk about who is the addressee. 
of the law who is committed to do what and when. So a um, core expression is the intermediary. Maybe Nick can explain us about that. Yeah, thanks, Christian, and hello, everybody. Um, I think it's worth just looking at sort of what's happened to date here and the fact that this directive itself um, came into force in um, June 2018, and each member state themselves now has to implement their national leg legislation to actually bring this into force, and that must be implemented by the 31st of December 2019, um, and then following that, the actual first sort of reporting requirement itself will arise on or after the 1st of July 2020. So at the moment, the phase that we're in is that the member states themselves are looking to implement this legislation into their um, own national um, legislation. And the UK, where we've got to on that, is back in July 2019, our tax authority published some draft implementing regulations and a consultation document. Um, now, those regulations stick fairly closely to the directive itself, and there's a lot of cross-referencing um, between the regulations and the uh, directive. Um, coming on to the way this is looking from a UK perspective, in terms of who the intermediary is, the person who has got this primary reporting obligation, well, this sort of falls into two camps. Firstly, there's the actual promoter. The promoter, that's the person that maybe designs, markets, organizes, actually makes available for implementation the cross-border arrangements. So that would typically perhaps be the tax advisor or the accountants or the a lawyer um, that's advising the clients themselves on the um, cross-border arrangements. Uh, a point probably to note here is that there's no exclusion for in-house advisors. So it's not just external advisors. If you've got in-house advisors in the company that are advising on a cross-border arrangement, they themselves could find themselves needing to actually be the um, reportable intermediary. Um, going a bit further than just the promoter, then there's also the service provider alongside that. And that's anybody that provides services, sort of directly or indirectly, in relation to the cross-border arrangements. And, and this is the very important point, and it's reasonable that that person, that service provider, knew that the arrangements were reportable. And that's potentially what brings a wider class of um, person into the kind of reporting of the arrangements that can perhaps bring in banks, notaries, trustees, anyone who assists with such, such arrangements can also come in and need to actually uh, be involved uh, uh, to determine whether they uh, are an intermediary and they have the knowledge that this is a uh, reportable arrangement. Um, just looking at that a little bit further, once an intermediary has been identified, then if they are resident in a member state, it's in that member state that they will be required to actually report. And if there's more than one intermediary, everybody has the obligation to report, but if it can be shown that a report has taken place in, in one member state, and there's proof of that, then actually the other intermediaries don't have to um, make a, a similar file because what you'll find is there will be information sharing between the tax authorities if it's been reported in one member state, then actually that will be shared with the other um, uh, member states as well. Um, so I think you do have to look who, who is going to do the reporting, uh, is the person actually a promoter of a scheme? They would typically do the reporting, but 
service providers as well, people who are actually involved in the implementation and had a reason to know that this was reportable, they can also get caught up here and need to um, report. So I think the kind of feeling here is that more parties than you might imagine could find themselves being classed as intermediaries and they will then need to determine if they have got a reporting obligation here. This uh, causes one question, uh, Nick. Uh, it, it's clear if you have a so-called um, structuring industry, let's say businesses that are designed to develop tax structures, aggressive structures, but as you have mentioned, a tax advisor dealing with clients' needs uh, and let's say with international permanent establishments of subsidiary, he may fall into the scope of this regime. So uh, one can say it's rather huge, the scope of application. And is it true if I say that every tax advisor that gives a client advice in an international tax case is potentially uh, 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 required to uh, disclose um, his advice to the tax authorities, or do I go too far? Um, I mean, it, it's, it's an over kind of arching position that if you are a tax advisor and you are advising people internationally, you are going to need to be well aware of this. Um, particular directive and how it's being implemented under your national legislation. That is actually certainly true. So us as tax advisors or anybody else sort of involved lawyers perhaps who are implementing cross-border arrangements, uh, perhaps uh, banks, as I've said, if they are more widely aware of what the arrangements are designed to do. So lots of parties will need to be aware of this legislation. But of course, not every cross-border transaction is reportable. And I know we'll come on to that, and that will be the key. So cross-border transactions will be in the frame, but whether they're actually going to be reportable or not, we'll need to look at that and decide whether actually it is a reportable transaction that meets one of the key kind of hallmarks of a reportable scheme. So that will really be the key for any intermediary to think through what that international that transaction is, how it's been designed, and whether it carries one of the particular hallmarks of a reportable uh, arrangement. Okay, we come back to the hallmarks later, and I think we have to address this point again later, because uh, as a tax advisor, you have to go uh, uh, the, uh, to take as less risk as possible. So maybe the practice will show that there's an exceeding practice of reporting, although maybe it's not uh, necessary from a legal standpoint. But uh, I, I would we, I, we have to come back to this point later. I would yeah, I would just add on that, Chris. I mean, it's uh, just a, an interesting side observation to that is the way this worked in the UK, because that was certainly when it was we had our own regime in. You know, introduced in 2004, which was the disclosure of tax avoidance schemes, the DOTAS regime, and certainly to start with, where there wasn't so much guidance around what needed to be reported and taxpayers were very cautious around it, there was a lot of reporting that went on and perhaps the tax authority themselves just became overwhelmed by how much information they were receiving. And what we found over time was that actually the guidance became a bit tighter and it became a bit clearer where the kind of boundaries were as to what needed to be reported and what didn't. Otherwise, the tax authority would potentially just have had too much information and they couldn't get through yeah. to actually necessarily looking at the, the schemes that were the most relevant ones. Yeah. There's a question coming in I would like to address to everybody in principle, uh, but maybe you have the first uh, choice, Nick. Uh, the question is, who has to report if the intermediary is located outside the EU? Um, yeah, that's uh, an interesting question. Um, if, the, if, if there is no kind of intermediary 
in the sense of the person who's promoted design the schemes or advisors actually um, in the EU, then it actually can be the taxpayer themselves that picks up the obligation to have to uh, report. Um, so you might find this, um, perhaps if there's a EU intermediary who's a lawyer and they've got legal privilege, then you know the obligation to report that cross-border arrangement could pass to the taxpayer if they themselves are resident in the EU. Okay, that's an interesting point. Um... come to this, uh, the aspect that the taxpayer himself has to report. Um, Emmanuel, could you give yes. us uh, the idea about that? When does a taxpayer have to report his own structure? Yeah, um, the two recipients uh, of a mandatory disclosure are uh, the intermediaries, as uh, we hear now, and the uh, taxpayers. So, um, any person who uh, make available a, a tax aggressive uh, cross border arrangement could be uh, obliged to disclose uh, this uh, uh, operation to the local tax uh, um, authority. Um, naturally, the taxpayer has to be uh, resident uh, for tax purposes uh, in Italy from an Italian point of view or in the other European country. And uh, uh, the, ta the taxpayers can be also an Italian uh, permanent establishment uh, which benefit uh, uh, from uh, these uh, uh, this situations. Uh, um, this is a very, um, very um, delicate problem because uh, um, uh, they have also um, a discussion in Italy uh, about uh, a way to uh, communicate uh, this information to the tax authority, uh, especially from the taxpayers' uh, point of view. And um, it's likely that in the future will we be uh, it, uh, the way to communicate uh, uh, this information will be settled by uh, next uh, measures of uh, uh, Italian uh, tax uh, uh, authorities. Yeah. So, this brings me to a point where so if the tax advisor himself has a professional privilege, uh, let's say the obligation to secrecy, then this doesn't help and the taxpayer is in the position to disclose, right? And what does this uh, mean for the relationship between the taxpayer and the tax advisor? Um, I could imagine uh, the, t the tax advisor has to take care of the needs of his client and the client trusts that uh, everything which is negotiated between him and uh, uh, the tax advisor is, uh, let's say, in secret rooms and it's protected by the law. And now uh, the advisor is in the function to be more or less a state agent and to disclose things. Well, do you think there is a, a, a sort of um, a, a disturbance of the relationship between the uh, client as a taxpayer and the advisor as the person with, that has a, a, a certain responsibility to take care of the client's needs. Do you think that yes. this relationship will, ha will be negatively uh, infected? Yes, it could be a problem in the relationships uh, between uh, uh, the tax advisors uh, and, they, and their clients because uh, uh, we understand that uh, uh, this law uh, couldn't, uh, could uh, be not uh, compliant with the obligation uh, to secrecy. So, um, 
in this moment uh, also in Italy there is a, a discussion about this point because uh, we don't understand uh, uh, where uh, um, can law um, can be uh, applied uh, without uh, this kind of uh, of, uh, of a violation violation um, and this also uh, the fact that uh, in this uh, applying the, uh, this uh, this kind of uh, uh, directive, uh, the tax uh, uh, advisors or lawyers uh, can uh, can uh, can appear as a st state uh, agents, uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, so it's uh, it's difficult uh, in this in this moment to understand uh, how can uh, can law can be compliant. Uh, with uh, the obligations of all the professionals. Okay. Uh, now, let's step further. I was say... to... Yeah. Big, please. I, I was just going to sort of add a comment there. Perhaps uh, you know, I think there are comparisons between different jurisdictions in how how the relationship is sort of perhaps viewed with this. Um, this legislation because I think from a UK perspective the fact that we've had this um, disclosure of tax avoidance schemes in place since 2004 and then that itself has been followed with some quite um, uh, widely drafted legislation um, which came along in say 2014 when we had um, some legislation specifically around promoters of tax avoidance schemes and then in 2016 we had enablers of tax avoidance schemes and the need to report. This is something which in the UK there's, a, there's been an awful lot of legislation that has come along which has been targeting um, the actual advisors and the need for them to actually um, report these kind of um, tax arrangements and therefore I think we're more accustomed to this in the UK than perhaps in some of the other um, European countries and this will just be a relationship which has already been explained to many UK taxpayers and this is just an extra dimension that you know with this um, mandatory, mandatory disclosure rules they're to some extent similar perhaps a bit more widely drafted in some aspects to what we've already got in in place, so I think here, from the UK perspective, this relationship that you know exists between the advisor and the um, the taxpayer, actually, we've already got things that have affected that, and we've had to get used to that, and that relationship has been uh, understood. Perhaps it's some of the other European countries where that's actually got to um, now take place, and it sounds like that is certainly something in Italy, um, which um, you know it needs to be. Um, develop that thinking. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Yeah, maybe so that you have get used to it. For us, it's a new situation. And as for me, I uh, cannot really stand these rules and um, I feel quite some uncomfortable. Um, but maybe the practice will show in future um, how it will develop. So let's uh, go further to the topic, uh, what has to be reported, because this is uh, a crucial at the end. And uh, maybe, Till, you could give us an overview, which yeah. is on the slide now. Yeah, so um, the EU decided to set up hallmarks. The hallmarks has to be met, so a case has to be reported. And you see here, uh, these are the notifiable marks. They are listed in the Annex 4 of the EU Directive. And you find there a whole sum of general characteristics and specific characteristics. And it makes it even more complicated that some of the hallmarks have also to meet a main benefit test and others do not have to meet such main benefit test to fall under the mandatory disclosure rule. Uh, main benefit test means that um, a tax planning must have as an aim in first place to save taxes. And if you want mainly to save taxes, then there are some hallmarks 
which fall only by meeting under this main benefit test under the mandatory disclosure rules and others do not have to meet such a test. And here on this slide, you can see first the general characteristics uh, mainly mandatory disclosure duty. And um, here you can see also the reporting obligation in connection with the main benefit test. And you see also the main advantage of a design as to obtaining some tax benefits. And some of these typical design models are loss utilization and loss transfer utilization of tax arbitrage. And something what is a little bit strange perhaps for us in Germany, because we are um, our client uh, and uh, tax advisor relationship is always confidential. But here we have one hallmark. Um, which contains a qualified confidentially clause test. So if um, a contract between the tax advisor and its client has a spe specified qualified confidentially clause, then this is a hallmark. And if you meet such a hallmark, then you have to disclose your tax planning structure. Then you see on the slide some of the specific characteristic, uh, characteristics. One are the structures for the use of qualification conflicts. We often use this in international tax planning, and if we use this in the future, we have to disclose this. Then you see structures linked to countries considered by the EU and the OECD as non-cooperating countries. You may know about the blacklist and the gray list, which is set up by the EU and which is overworked every two to three months. So if you make a tax planning with a country, which falls or which stands still on the black list, then you also meet a hallmark and then you have to disclose an aggressive, an aggressive tax planning. And another big subject of BEPS has been the using of transparent and intransparent structures. And if you have intransparent structures, then you have also um, a hallmark which leads to a mandatory disclosure rule. And the point is, these are only some of the characteristics. In the future, we have always to go to the polling. If you counsel a client, you have to make a check whether you meet one of the hallmarks. And if perhaps also, you have to check whether you meet the main benefit test. And if you do so, then you have to disclose this. So this makes life for a tax advisor in the future pretty difficult. And it makes it also pretty difficult for our clients. Thank you, Till. We'll take a closer look uh, in a few minutes. Uh, the concept of tax benefit test. This is now a uh, topic on the next slide. Uh, I have the impression that this leaves still a lot of uh, room for interpretation open. and. Uh, but the idea maybe is uh, uh, quite good uh, shown on the next slide. Nick, you have most experience uh, or practical experience with uh, tax benefit tests. Could you uh, summarize uh, the, the core idea of the legislation? Yeah, I think this is it is actually quite difficult to get to grips with. But um, as Till said that, you know, a number of the hallmarks that he pointed out will only apply if this main benefit test is met. Um, and, you know, you're looking to see whether one of the main benefits that, you know, somebody is expecting to derive from the arrangements is a tax advantage. So is somebody getting a tax advantage, is that one of the main uh, benefits? And I think the point to really make here is this main benefit test is applied objectively so it's not looking at someone's actual motivation for undertaking a transaction but it's rather looking at whether the benefits a person um, uh, might reasonably be expected to obtain um, were a tax advantage. So you don't actually have to look at intentions 
or necessarily someone's motivation for undertaking a, a transaction. It's really seeing whether one of the benefits from the arrangement was actually um, the obtaining of a tax advantage. So that is a slightly uh, nuanced sort of position that you have to be aware of that distinction. Um, and in the UK, we do have these main benefit tests in a number of, um, of our pieces of legislation, and it certainly is something which we've had to sort of get to grips with under our own disclosure regime. And I think there's often quite a low threshold that a tax advantage can often be a benefit that arises from a transaction. And the way that it typically is looked at here is that it's any benefit that's not incidental. So you know, that's quite a low threshold that often the tax advantage won't be just an incidental element of a transaction. It will probably be quite a relevant part of the transaction, even if it wasn't the taxpayer's main motivation for the transaction. If actually there is a tax advantage and it's not just an incidental part of it, then actually that will mean that the main benefit test is met. So it's quite a difficult thing to to understand this. Sort of pulling the terms apart a bit, I mean, you need to actually think, well, firstly, is it a tax which is actually covered by the um, directive? Um, and the directive actually applies to all taxes other than certain ones, VAT, customs duties, excise duties, um, social security. So and any equivalent uh, worldwide taxes uh, as well. So it's pretty broad in terms of what taxes are included here. And then you ask yourself, is there a tax advantage that has actually you know, been a benefit of the arrangements? And tax advantage itself can be anything such as a, a relief from tax, a repayment of tax, uh, a reduction in the, the charge of tax, um, you know, um, something that defers the payment of tax. So when you actually pull the words apart, what the tax is, what the advantage is, whether a benefit actually arises from the transaction, as you, you rightly said, Chris, I think this is, is pretty broad and there is quite a low threshold that often that main benefit test will be met, um, even if that wasn't, you know, exactly why somebody designed the arrangement in that way. Yeah. So this proves that there's a lot of uncertainty and what I do not understand concerning this concept is the following. If I have a structure, then the structure is either legal or illegal. So I cannot distinguish uh, uh, a legal but unfunded tax benefit, then it's a legal benefit, isn't it? So we are just talking about legal structures and a benefit, tax benefit is legal even though it's unfunded. So we have to find out what is unfunded and what is not unfunded. And if we have an illegal tax benefit, we are talking about tax evasion. This is not our topic. So, um, yes. So the aim is obviously to find the loopholes in the tax law in order to close the possibility for legal structures with a certain tax benefit. Is this a summarize of the intention maybe? Uh, I think it's broader than that to, to be honest that you can have just commercial transactions that taxpayers enter into that although obtaining a tax advantage wasn't necessarily why they structured it that way. There is a tax advantage that comes from the transaction. Um, and if it has one of the um, hall scheme hallmarks, it will end up being reportable. So, it, you know, there will be transactions here which are purely commercial that people enter into, which do give rise to one of the hallmarks. The main benefit test, as we've said, um, you know, the tax benefit test can be fairly low. If a tax um, advantage comes from those arrangements, it can end up being reportable. So I think that's the difficulty of this legislation is broadly drafted and people who are doing legal transactions, which are commercial, 
cross-border, they will still have to think about whether this can apply or not. Okay, I thought that the legislation has the aim to deliver information to the tax authorities that they put into new tax law in order to close loopholes. So it's more or less about um, new information about new structures which has, uh, hasn't been seen by the tax authorities so far. Um, so this is what I wonder, for example, if there is a structure which is um, Potential, potentially known by tax authorities because they have been discussed in professional journals or even they have been subject to uh, court cases which are published in the, uh, in the uh, court journals. So is this something to do if uh, a structure or transaction as such is uh, uh, known or unknown or potentially known? Is this a criteria? Uh, it's not a criteria, uh, absolutely not, uh, but what tax authorities obviously are looking for is this kind of early warning system um, to know where tax arrangements are being used by taxpayers to achieve tax advantages and then they have the information to decide whether that's something that needs to be challenged or something which you know is perhaps just caught up in this quite broadly drafted legislation but doesn't necessarily give rise to a concern. So again, going back to the way the UK saw this implemented, there was a lot of information initially where reporting was taking place where the transaction may not have given the tax authority any particular concern um, but over time, the narrowing in terms of the focus of the legislation meant that they were getting much more relevant information, probably more focused on the schemes that would give rise to concern. So I think the way this EU um, legislation is being drafted is that a lot of transactions which wouldn't necessarily give tax authorities concern will end up or could be reportable, and then hopefully over time, tax uh, authorities may um, clarify the legislation a bit more and it may become a little bit more tightly drafted so that the transactions that they're, they're not going to be um, so concerned about end up not having to be reported but that's not how things are set up at this moment in time. So I think this is an important uh, result that we have uh, figured out so far. This has nothing to do if a structured transaction or so on is known already or potentially known to the tax authorities. This is not at all criteria, even though that uh, you can be uh, obliged to report, even though all law journals are discussing these structures. So you could not uh, defend yourself uh, by saying, okay, I don't have to report because everybody in the tax world already knows about it. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah, that's correct, definitely. Yeah. And it okay. makes sense from, from, the, from the point of the tax authorities. They don't want to know the abstract model. They want to know from each taxpayer whether he uses it uh, concretely. Well, but what, Till, what happens if, if the case uh, were or this has been decided by a tax court and in favor of, let's say, in favor of the taxpayer. So we have an actual case, we have the construction, we have a, a, a court that says this was a legal structure and it was a legal benefit. And then, and you have, you are now in the position, you have a similar structure with another client, but it is a similar structure, then you still have to report it although it's already in the law books, let's say. If you ask me as a tax consultant, I say it's the same and I don't have to disclose it. If you ask me as a former member of the tax administration, then I want to know whether it's really the same case or perhaps there's a slight difference and then perhaps a slight difference makes a difference. Okay, till then, please explain to us the next slide uh, <laughs> because uh, <laughs> this <laughs> brings us deeper into the... Uh, discussion. Well, I don't know whether we have the time in 10 minutes to explain all the marks. Okay, um, maybe maybe uh, you, you may uh, uh, pick out uh, what you think is most important. 
Well, I mean, first, uh, um, you see, it is uh, quite a complicated structure. So, um, first thing is, if you don't have the whole um, slide in mind, you have always to check it, first point. Then you have to find out in your client uh, tech advisor relationship, what do you have really pretty often? For example, number um, four on the left side, multiple consideration of a tax relevant situation. This might be happen pretty often. Or uh, number three, standardized documentation or structure without individual adaption. So if you are a tax lawyer who who sells tax structures, then you have to disclose this, for example. Or in number six, the conversion of income into capital donation or low tax income. This might be also a tax planning structure. And if you have this, you have to disclose it. Number seven, Christian, correct me, but I don't know that we ever a circular transaction, whatever a circular transaction might be, because this is not defined very well in my opinion. But normally, from my understanding, we did not use it. But I mean, is this a VAT kind of... transaction or is it what does it mean? No, it can be both. VAT is not 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 uh, not a part of, of of the taxes which falls under 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 the CDR. So um, okay. perhaps Nick has, has some ideas for this, or Emmanuel. But I mean, for my knowledge, we did not use it. But I mean, if you if you count for yeah. transactions, then you have to discuss it. For example. Okay. Let's. Uh, okay. We can leave uh, this point open. I think so. Yeah. We will run out of time. So. Um, but I mean, let me just one point. If you if you are like us and in transfer pricing arrangements on the on the bottom side on the right, you see there are only three points. But if you hit one of the three points, use of a, a, a unilateral safe harbor rule or creating immaterial assets that are difficult to value, this we have pretty often. Or if you have a relocation of function with subsequent 50% decline at domestic EBIT, these are the cases where you fall under a mandatory closure rule. Okay, if in which format do you disclose i think this has every country to define itself by its law and we in germany have uh, in our new law or new designed law um, they give us um, a, a structure on um, how we have to disclose this to the german tax administration probably i think uh, the, the british law provides the same nick correct me but i understood that you have for your dota regime the same and probably um, Emmanuel has also a fixed set of structure of, of data which you have to disclose to the tax authorization. Yeah, we have later, we have a slide on that. I fear that we do not have all the time to discuss it. Uh, but thing is that you have to disclose within 30 days. So yeah. that's pretty short. Yeah, it's very short. If you have three or four weeks on vacation, then you have a problem. Yeah, is there a possibility to postpone? So let's say you make a call to the tax authority, say, oh, I know I have to disclose within 30 days, I'm on holiday, I make it the next month later, is it possible? Well, I mean, I think you can always apply for this. This is the same as the transfer pricing documentation. There we have a 60 days rule in Germany, but if you apply for a prolonging in Germany, you get it. I don't know how it's in other countries, but you have to apply for this. Well, I think from a UK perspective, what we've seen is when you fall into these regimes, that things become very structured in the way they need to be um, dealt with, and the timelines are generally um, strictly enforced, and therefore you do need to be very aware of timelines, deadlines, when actual... Uh, um, anything needs to be uh, communicated with the, uh, the tax or authorities because if you fall outside of them you can find that you are on the back foot with the, uh, the tax authority so we tend to make sure that things are done you know certainly uh, within within the deadlines that are set out in the legislation yes in italy too 
in Italy too, um, the draft law uh, um, doesn't allow to postpone uh, uh, the deadline of uh, 30 days uh, um, and uh, it's not uh, possible to postpone this kind of information. The intermediaries and the taxpayers has uh, to respect uh, the deadline on uh, uh, 30 days uh, in this version of a draft law. Nick, how do you do it practically? Do you just send the tax opinion that you gave to your client, you make a copy and send it to the tax authorities, or do you make a new set of documentation? I think as, as you look on in, in the, the slides, you'll get to the point where you see what actually needs to be reported here in terms of you know each transaction will need to be looked at in terms of exactly so, why that arrangement so, is being reported. And, I go you know, ahead for everybody. Uh, oh, I was the wrong direction. Excuse me. There it. There we are. Is that the right? So, oh. That's right. So you'll find there's, there's, you know, a lot of sort of standing information in terms of the uh, the facts about the user, as well as the intermediary, uh, will have to provide some standard um, facts. And then you'll have to actually provide details of the hallmark that makes the uh, cross-border arrangement reportable, um, including other sort of aspects such as the values that are involved, the timing of the transactions, the um, member states in which the taxpayers are based. So there's a lot of standard information, and I think this will be one of the... Uh, the difficulties, it's always one of the difficulties with reporting to tax authorities, is having that information available and collecting that information from taxpayers and extracting it from the documentation that can take quite a lot of time and um, effort to actually bring one of these reports together. Thank you, Nick. We have some minutes left only, and there are a lot of more slides to discuss. I just, at, at the end, as the highlight, at the end, I will address one point. Now I'm looking for the slide, and this is a point that really sets me up. Because it's, a, it's the retroactive uh, timeline. So let's say we have a law which has draft status now, and it will be uh, come into force uh, uh, maybe beginning of next year, and we have to report facts that played in the past. This uh, uh, really sets me up. And um, so, actually, this uh, we are now in a, a stage where we have to act as if the law is in force. And now I have a question. I, will, I put it to everybody in the round. Um, is that constitutional under the local law? We in Germany, we have uh, a law that says, in generally, you are not allowed to have a retroactive law. You need a, a specific justification in order to do that. And is this uh, acceptable and constitutional from, uh, let's say, a liberal standpoint of uh, uh, fundamental rights? Um, to uh, uh, disturb uh, the people with a retroactive enforcement of uh, such a law. What is the opinion in the audience uh, or participants here? Yeah, in Italy, uh, the taxpayers' uh, um, articles of uh, uh, association uh, doesn't, al uh, in general, doesn't allow uh, retroactive uh, effects uh, of uh, tax law. So um, the discussion that there is now in Italy is that uh, the, the effect of this uh, uh, directive could be uh, the, the cause of, uh, um, of litigations uh, from the uh, taxpayers. Uh, so now we are trying to understand how uh, this law could, uh, can have a retroactive effect uh, uh, which is uh, a principle not uh, compliant with uh, the taxpayer articles of uh, associations. Till, do you, do you think the German constitutional law could 
conclude this retroactive uh, uh, regulation as unconstitutional? Well, normally it is problematic whether we can take a law back to the year before, but here we have to see it is a EU directive and the EU directive is in force for all Europeans and it mentioned already in 2018 that this will come into force in 2020. So nobody can say, I didn't know anything about this. Everybody should have known from that date on that this or the tax plannings which I make during that time will fall under a mandatory disclosure duty. So I think it is difficult to say this is completely against European law or against the German constitution. In my opinion, which is I mean, higher than the European law, by the way. Yeah, but okay. anyway, I mean, even then, you have to consider that everybody knew what comes comes up in the next one and a half years. Yeah, yeah. So I fear you, you are right. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Um. So actually, the time for our discussion is over now. I do not know if we have exceeding time to uh, discuss more. So in order to be within the uh, uh, foreseen timeline, I would like to thank everybody for the contribution and uh, the audience that was listening uh, live in the internet. So we see that this is a topic which uh, will bring us a lot of more discussion in the future and uh, let's see what the practice bring and um, if it's in the end as far as uh, we have discussed it today. So thank you very much to everybody and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Thank you.